Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Go ahead and turn over to Mark chapter 3. Um, this is actually very reminiscent of the first sermon I ever preached at my home church. Um, am I really hot? Okay. <laughs> so, um, but this is very reminiscent of the first sermon I ever preached at my home church right before I left for Rama. Um, I had a class, um, homiletics, with um, Mid America Christian University. I went there for a while. Um, I had to record myself giving a sermon, and I was telling my pastor about it one day, and he's like, ah, you just. Preach Wednesday night service, and we'll record it, and you can do I'm like, uh. <laughs> But it was a good experience, you know. He, um, yeah, he always recognized, you know, the gifts of everybody in the church, and he used them accordingly. And I thank God for that time, because it was a learning lesson, because I got through my entire sermon in about eight minutes. Um, went through it again, about another eight minutes, and so I had to, uh, Mark 11, 23, and 24. <laughs> You know, so you just start preaching on something else, and you know it was, but it was a learning experience, you know, about you know preparing and everything like that. And so, um, but something that happened in this past week um, in the news, which I'll get to later, is what really, you know, I, whenever Pastor told me I was going to preach, that, that this is what came up in me, uh, because you know there's some things going on in the world right now that are troubling. But, you know, thank God that as Christians we have the Holy Spirit inside of us to guide us, and God is on our side. Um, so uh, we're going to start off in Mark 3, uh, but before we go there, I'm going to tell a little bit of a story. I love history, obviously. Um, I'm a history major. I plan on teaching it one day. Um, and I also, of course, I was in the, in the Navy, so I love military history. Um, the story I'm going to tell you is about the USS Indianapolis. Um, is a car or no, I'm sorry, a cruiser in World War II, and on uh, midnight, well, just after midnight on July 30th, in 1945, um, Indianapolis was struck by the Japanese sub I-58 in the South Pacific. Um, there were 1,196 souls on board, and in the first, in the initial attack, 300 people died, like from the explosion, uh, from drowning, <clears throat> anything like that. Well, the remaining Roughly 900 were stranded out at sea for four days. Um, they faced dehydration, exposure, um, saltwater poisoning, and shark attacks. And while they were floating, waiting for somebody to save them. But the Navy, or not everybody in the Navy, knew that the ship was out there because at the time they were carrying half of the world's supply of uranium. And so it was a secret mission to get it over because they were going to use it for Little Boy the first bomb we dropped on Hiroshima. And so they didn't want anybody knowing that it was there. And so basically they're out there stranded. They have nobody to save them. Um, when I was in boot camp, we had uh, what was called um, battle stations. Uh, it was like your final test before you get to graduate from boot camp and you know, you're into the Navy. Every service has their form of it. I think the Marines have the crucible, which is like a week long in the field where they're basically up for a week and got yeah, maybe an hour of sleep a day and they're doing all kinds of exercise and everything. Um, Army, I believe they go out to the field for a week or so. Um, Air Force, I think they just tie their shoes. And <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, actually, best food I ever had was on a Keesler Air Force Base. Um, I just got out of boot camp eating all that terrible food and I get to Keesler Air Force Base and like, it was like gourmet meals there. Anyways, but the Navy has battle stations. And basically what it is, it's a 24-hour. Um, you start off at about 10 o'clock at night, and you go through until 10 o'clock in the morning, or 10 o'clock the next night, doing all sorts of different things. Um, basically, they simulate anything that can go wrong on a ship goes wrong. And you've got to 
you know, survive, basically. Um, but one of the drills was the uh, USS Indianapolis. We simulate what happened to them. Uh, we go to the pool. That's just a huge, I mean, it's about three Olympic-sized pools, you know, and then they have a 10-foot platform. And you're in your coveralls and your boots, and you got to jump off the platform and survive for X amount of time. And there's a group of 20 of you that goes in. And there's only 10 life jackets spread about. Because what happened was with the Indianapolis, is they didn't have enough lifeboats, or they didn't have enough life jackets. Yeah, you know, I think during World War II, they didn't, you know, it's like the Titanic, they didn't think about these things. They didn't think it was gonna happen. And so, 20 of us had to figure out how to survive. <laughs> 20 of us had to figure out how to survive for the next, um, you know, 10, 20 minutes, however long it was. Well, it came down to, we figured out, if there's 20 of us, 10 life jackets, obviously only half of us are gonna get the life jackets. And so we're going to have to find a way to keep the other ten afloat. Well, what we did was we formed a circle arm in arm with a life jacket in between, you know, like every other one. And um, had to take our boots off, tie them, put it around our neck and all this other stuff. And, but that's essentially, you know, what they taught us to survive is to, you have to stay together. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today um, is unity. You know, that's something that's very much needed today. Um, hard times are coming our way. And that's, you know, not a negative confession. Jesus said it. You know, bad times are coming. But as long as we stay together, as long as we're, as a church and as the body in general, we're going to get through it. And so over in Mark chapter 3, this is too high or something. It's too low. Is that better? Okay. And so Mark chapter 3, we start off in verse 24. Um, actually, I, I love the, the Gospel of Mark. It's actually my favorite Gospel. Um, I never knew why until I took a class on the Gospels. And um, can you hear me? Hello? 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 Okay. Um, <clears throat> you know, as when I was taking this class on the Gospels, um, I found out the reason why I liked the Gospel of Mark was because it has what they call the messianic secret. Um, it was written toward, to the Gentiles by Mark. And he used what's called the messianic secret to um, basically build up a plot in his story to the Gentiles. He's telling the story. It's kind of like a movie, you know, it has a character development plot. And then at the very end, it's bam, that's when you find out who Jesus is. And it's just. And that's why I like it, I guess, because I love movies. But <laughs> anyways, um, and Mark. <laughs> oh, it's going to be steady. It's not going to be steady. All right. Well, as high as we can get it then. Trying to get as high as we can get it. And, uh. Okay. <laughs> um, anyways, Mark chapter 3, uh, verse 24. Um, Jesus says, If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And so we know, obviously, I mean, this is... This, this, there's not much else to say about it, really. Um, unity is a very important thing. If, let's just say in your household, you know, if you have a husband and a wife who aren't in agreement with each other and working towards the same goals and everything, then that house is probably not going to stand as a household very long. It's because you're both going in separate directions and you want to do different things. Um, and so, you know, there's a This goes back to the Indianapolis, actually. Um, like I said, whenever we figured out that you know, we had to do the thing we had to do to survive, um, you know, we found out later when they were explaining you know, the whole scenario and everything that the reason why you want to do that is because sharks won't attack people in a group. Um, if you're in a group like that, in smaller groups, they're, not gonna want, they're, they're less likely to attack you. However, if you break off from the group and try to survive on your own, 
then you're basically fresh meat for them, and they're ready to take you out. Um, out of those, out of the 1,200 that survived the initial attack, only 317 were actually uh, rescued at the end of the four days. And they said a lot of them did not stay with them. They got, you know, uh, delusions, delirium, that sort of thing, and um, basically went, you know, with the, with the sun, dehydration, heat, and everything, they basically started going crazy. And they started swimming out towards islands they thought they saw or and everything like that, and they started getting, you know, taken out and everything. And so, but the group that did survive were the ones that banded together. And they were um, actually spotted by a, just a, a patrol plane flying over, managed to see, you know, the wreckage and everything. It's like, oh my gosh, radioed it in, landed on the water against orders he wasn't supposed to, and then got as many into the plane as he could. When that was full, he started strapping people <laughs> to the wings just to get them out of there. So he, can, and he saved, I think, 56 that day until another ship came and was able to save the rest. But, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an important thing um, to stay together, obviously. And go ahead and turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 3. As I was uh, thinking about today, I started thinking about a, a story. I heard about a missionary who went to India. And he went, um, was preaching to the villages and all that. And he, he met the man the, who was the leader of the village. Very smart man, uh, very learned, knew about the you know, history and everything of India. And he was, he was very revered and wise. And um, the missionary gave him a copy of the New Testament and said, sir, I want you to read this. You know, you're a very smart man. I think you'll understand what this means. And so he says, I'll be back, um, I, I think, some like a week, and we can talk about it, and then, you know, we'll go from there. Because he had the, um, the thought that, you know, if I can get this man saved and get him to believe in Jesus, yeah. that he can use his influence to help the other ones around him. So the missionary comes back after a week, and he says, so what you think of the, of, of, the, of the Bible I gave you? He says, well, it was really good, but where's the other half? He didn't even know there was an Old Testament. But by reading the New Testament, he knew that there was something, else, something missing from that text. And so that you know, just shows the importance of reading the Old Testament and understanding it, because you know, the, those people were examples for us. You know, we, we can take examples from their faith. We can take examples from their, where well, they messed up, where they you know, got it wrong. And uh, I was reading Deuteronomy about, it was about two years ago, um, and I ran across this verse, or the set of verses that was really interesting to me, because I never knew it was here. But in chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 18, of course we know that Deuteronomy is the sermons that Moses um, presented to the Israelites right before they were about to take the land. You know, Moses couldn't go into the land because of disobedience. He struck the rock twice when he wasn't supposed to. But he was leaving them with the wisdom, you know, to, as they went on. Uh, he reiterated the law, you know, the, the different things in the law, just to just remind them, you know, if you're obedient, God will bless you. But if you're not obedient, you know, you're, he's not going to bless you. But you can repent yeah. and be accepted again. So we'll start off in, uh, like I said, verse 18. So then I commanded you at that time, saying, The Lord your God has given you this land to possess. All you men of valor shall cross over armed before your brethren, the children of Israel. But your wives, your little ones, and your livestock, I know that you have much livestock, shall stay in your cities, which I have given you. And so the Lord has given rest to your brethren as to you, and they also possess the land which, which the Lord your God is giving them beyond the Jordan. Then each of you may return to his possession, which I have given you. Basically, he's telling the children of Israel, because Israel was divided up in 12, 11 different um, regions for each tribe. Um, the Levites didn't have their own because they were the priests and they you know, went around and everything. Um, so Moses is telling them, he says, okay, when you cross over, you're crossing over together. All your warriors are crossing over together. When you take that piece of land, you leave your wives and your children there, and then you move on to the next one, and you move on to the next one. No man could, could call any piece of land his home until all of Israel was taken over. And I thought that was an interesting concept because a lot of times as Christians, we're always believing God for something. 
Or we should be, at least. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's our faith walk. That's, yeah. We live by faith. And so we should be believing God for whatever it is, whether it's a new job, whether it's, you know, more ability to go out and preach. You know, whatever it is, we should be believing God for something. And we've gotten to the mindset where, okay, I'm believing God for a job. Okay, I have my victory, you know. Months later, I get my victory. So I'm done. Well, no, you're not done because there's people around you who are fighting battles as well. And you should be hooking up with them. Like if I'm leaving God for a job and then Karen says, you know, I need a new job. I need, you know, I need to make more money for my family and God, I need you to provide this. Well, I can hook up with her. I can say, you know, I, I can believe God and pray for her as well and help her in any way. And then when she gets her victory, somebody else says, you know, I, I, need, I need to believe God for healing. Well, we can hook up with that too. You know, our, our job is never done just because we get what we want. And I believe a lot of times, you know, the, the, the issues we're facing today are because as the church, back in the 80s and 90s, we were too focused on ourselves. You know, the prosperity gospel came, and it's amazing I'm not bashing the prosperity gospel because God does provide, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But when you take it to an extreme, to where all you care about is getting what is coming to you, then bad things happen. You know, this is, you know, a lot of the issues we're having is because the church wasn't standing strong on other issues. I say that's my personal belief, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, and so go ahead and turn over to 2 Samuel. Chapter 12. Um, here we're going to pick up where um, David had just been called out on his sin, where he, um, you know, he committed adultery with Bathsheba, and then he tried to cover it up by different means, and, you know, she got pregnant and all that, and so he's trying to cover it up, and eventually he winds up killing one of his commanders, uh, Uriah, and, you know, one sin turned into a snowball of sin, and um, Nathan comes in, um, and, you know, basically gives him a parable that's the exact same thing that he did, but he didn't know it at the time. Um, and so once David finally figures out that it's about him, Nathan pronounces the, the, you know, what, what's going to happen as a result of this. And so we're going to start in chapter, or verse 9. This is Nathan saying, Why have you despised the commandments of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with your sword, and you have taken his wife to be your wife, and have, killed, and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me, and have taken the wife Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes, I'll take your wives before your eyes, and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it in secret, but I will do this thing before all of Israel, before the sun. Um, the sin that David committed allowed division to come within his house. Yeah. He talks about how I will raise, um, source and I will leave your house, and I will raise adversity against you from your own house. Well, later on, we learn that Absalom, um, David's son, leads a rebellion against him. Yeah. And he actually succeeds for a little while before David comes back and you know, sets it all right. But this is where like, the big division of Israel happens. Um, because of this sin, God allows others to come in and to you know, basically start wrecking Israel. And then later on, after Solomon, the kingdom divides between Judah and Israel. And you just see you know, there's not many times within that period where Israel is just all good. There's always something going on. There's some conflict. They're either being taken, you know, as possessions, and then repenting, and God saving them, and then they go back to the cycle over and over again. But that just goes to show that, you know, division even in a country is, you know, destructive. Yeah. And it happened because one man did wrong and didn't correct it and that sort of thing. And so, but... Go ahead and turn over to Acts chapter 1. Um, that's all good, you know, because we saw the Old Testament. And, you know, we know that 
it's a different time. Um, but what about today? You know, does this still apply today? Well, yeah, we saw in Mark that Jesus says the house divided cannot stand. But also over here in Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 14. talking about the apostles after uh, Jesus had left the earth. It said, they all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And jumping down to um, chapter 2, verse 1, it says, when the day of Pente Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The church began in unity. You know, the twelve disciples and everybody who was in the upper room was in one accord. They were praying to God and, you know, all together to bring down the Holy Spirit. And as a result of their obedience, because God told them to wait and, you know, for the Holy Spirit, but because they were together they brought the presence of God. I mean, it was, a, it was an incredible thing. But that's not the only example in Acts. In chapter 2, verse 46 and 47, he said, um, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. You know, after that first filling of the Holy Spirit, Peter went down and, you know, preached a sermon and 3,000 people got saved. So the church was growing like crazy. But it talks about here in verse 46 but that they continued in one accord with each other and people were added daily to their midst. And so the church was growing exponentially at this point because the church was united. Uh, go over to Acts uh, chapter 4, starting in verse 24. And um, actually, to start in 23, um, the, Peter and John had just been arrested by the Jews and sent back, you know, they had been released because they were unlearned men and they were told not to um, preach Jesus anymore. So they went back to their people. And verse 24 says, So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God, who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. And by the mouth of your servant David have said, and I'm going to go ahead and um, go down to verse 31. It said, and when they prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So once again, when they came together in one accord, persecution had come to the people. But they came back to their own people, united, prayed, and they were filled more with boldness and more with the Holy Spirit, which I think is a pretty incredible thing. Chapter 5, verse 12. <clears throat> and through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Uh, verse 15. So they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So when the church was together, people were being healed. People were being set free. People were um, not just, um, you know, health-wise, but spirit-wise. You know, they were able to, to, to present a united front to the world and completely change the world they were living in. In uh, John chapter 17, go ahead go there. The, um, this whole you know, chapter is obviously a prayer that God, uh, Jesus is lifting up to God as he's about to be crucified. He knows his fate. He knows um, he has to do this. He's already gone through the, you know, if this cup may pass, please let it. But not my will, but yours be done. So he already knows he's going to the cross. He knows what's happening. But Jesus says three prayers in this chapter. The first one is for himself, um, to give him the strength to go to the cross. The second one starts in verse 6. He prays for his disciples, 
that they may go out and you know, do the works that he's commanded them. But starting in chapter 20 till the end of the chapter, he's talked about all believers. It's not just the disciples, but all the believers that are to come. Um, you know, I think it's interesting that the last prayer that Jesus you know, gives to the Father what had nothing to do with him, had nothing to do with anything else, but the very last thing he prays about was for everybody here on earth today. He was a believer uh, for the whole church in general. So we're going to start in verse 21. Actually, verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through your word. He's talking about the disciples. I don't pray just for them, but for everybody who's going to come. That they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may, not, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, and they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. So two things he says results out of, peop- out of church being in unity, uh, church being together, not just through God and Jesus, but in each other, is that the world will believe that you sent me. So how do we get people to believe that God sent Jesus? We come together. <laughs> you know, it's, it's simple and yet hard because there's so many different opinions, there's so many different um, views on how you know, things should be done that we can't all come together at the moment. And um, in verse 23, the other result is um, that the world may know that you sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. And so we see that not only will they believe that God sent them, but they'll believe that Jesus loves them and God loves them in you know, a certain way. Um, so I'm going to use another military illustration here because I think it's, it, it works. Anyways, June 6, 1944, everybody knows D-Day. That was the day that um, the Allies invaded Europe through France at the, at the beach of Normandy. They started off in Britain, went across the English Channel, and then that's when the campaign in Europe like, really started. Um, but it wasn't just the Americans that did it. You know, a lot of times we think it was just you know, our guys that went over and took over the whole beach, but it was the Brits, the Canadians, um, Americans. I believe there were some French involved as well. But they were able to show Hitler that they weren't going down without a fight. And it was the, the largest invasion ever in the history. And it was one of the most successful ones, even though we lost a lot of men. But through that show of force, through that unity that they showed, they were able to show the enemy that, you know, we're not going to sit by while you do what, <laughs> whatever you think you can do. We're going we're gonna to go and we're going we're gonna to fight you. We're going we're gonna to take over. And that's the front... If we're united as the church, that's the front that we take towards the devil. Yeah. That's, the, that's the front we take towards the enemy. You know, it says the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Yeah. Well, sometimes I, I get the feeling that we think of that as, well, when we get attacked, we're not going to be, you know, they, they can't prevail against us. But how many gates have you seen that move? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, how many gates actually move? Unless you're watching Lord of the Rings and they have those ones that like, you know, they push across and anyway. Um, but no, the gates of hell were not prevailing against the church is because we're supposed to be going united together, attacking the gates of hell and saving everybody who's there, you know. Raising hell is that whether, you know, R-A-Z-E, you know, get them out of there and everything. So that's, that's what I think of when I think of, you know, when we're supposed to show the love of God, when we're supposed to show the united front against, God, uh, against the devil, it's not just... Obviously, there's strength in numbers. You know, Normandy wouldn't have been a success had the Canadians done what they wanted to do, the Brits done what they wanted to do. We, we did just whatever we wanted to do. It was a combined force. It was a calculated, they, I mean, times. Um, the number of troops, what they were going to do at this time, this time, that was all coordinated, you know, in a specific way. And that's how we should be as a church. We should all be united against one common goal. Um, 
this week, um, the Pope had said something uh, that really it was interesting to say the least. Um, and it was disheartening a little bit. Um, why don't we read this from a news report? Um, Pope Francis. Pope Francis encouraged Christians to turn to the Holy Spirit to remind them of Jesus' words and guide them in preparing to be witnesses, and this is his quote, with small everyday martyrdoms or with a great martyrdom according to God's will. He also says, they will expel you from the synagogues. In fact, the, honors, the hour is coming when everyone who kills you will think he is offering worship to God. You know, the Pope took, um, it's John 16, 1 through 2, where he talks about um, the people who kill you would think they're doing a service for God. Um, a lot of people think they're just talking about the Christians over in the Middle East. You know, um, there's, a, there's a lot of people dying over there right now um, for their beliefs. Um, ISIS is doing their thing. Um, they decided that they wanted to create an Islamic State, and they're doing everything they can to do that. And the church over there is suffering for it. Now, when we're talking about kids being crucified, um, mothers being ripped from their, from their children, being killed. And we've seen the videos of, you know, soldiers and Christians being killed on the beaches just for the fact that they're Christians and that they'll do whatever they can to, to take over. Um, but you don't hear a lot about it in the news, you know, about these things going on because we're, it seems like we're too, you know, worried about who won The Voice or American Idol or, you know, what happened in the last episode of whatever. Um, but those are our brothers and sisters over there. I know that we can't go, that we can't all just jump on a plane and go over there and save them all, but we can be praying for them a lot. Um, you know, there's no distance in prayer. There's things that God can do through us, through prayer, intercession. You don't know, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night and you have an urge to pray. It could be because you, you're praying a way for a family to get out of there, to save themselves from, you know, what's going on. Um, it could be that, I don't, I don't know, I don't know. There's, there's, there's things that we could be doing. <laughs> I don't know, I don't have the answers for it. You know, I, I wish I did. Um, you know, we, we need to pray for laborers to go out there, that's for sure, um, to, get, to get them out of there. Um, it's becoming, I think I heard the statistic that there was, before the ISIS um, threat came along, there was 1.2 million Christians in the area that they were in, and now there's only about 280,000. Yeah, that's a lot of people gone. You know, and we don't know if they're all refugees or if they were all killed. You know, that's, that's three-fourths of the population of Christians is, is just not there anymore. Um, but that's where this came from is because, um, you know, they may not believe exactly the way we believe. Uh, most of the ones being um, executed are the Coptic Christians. Um, they may, like I said, they may be a little different than us, but they still profess Jesus as Lord. Yeah. They're still our brothers yeah. and our sisters. And so we need to be doing all we can to lift them up and to do, um, you know, if, if you find out, you know, some charity is, is doing something to send aid, you know, I'm not saying send money, but, you know, pray for that charity. Yeah. Spread the word. You know, maybe somebody can, you know, get some you know, money over there or whatever. There's always something you can do, but prayer is the main thing. That's, that's what I'm... I guess I'm trying to get across here is just be praying for these people. Um, there's no, the brutality that they're facing is, is unlike anything we've seen since World War II. Um, it's just, it's, a, it's crazy. Um, but, you know, I think there are some, there are, uh, there are some people in the body of Christ who are trying to heal the divide. You know, um, the, just recently I heard of um, a denomination, a major denomination who um, for the longest time had 
punished anybody within you know their ministry who spoke in tongues, um, and who vehemently spoke against it, like did not allow it at all, are now easing that restriction, and that's a that's a big step, because that you know that's a big dividing factor between this denomination and kind of like what we believe in. That's like the big thing, yeah. and when you start tearing down walls like that, I'm not I'm not talking about being accepting of lifestyles that are right. not right. You know, a lot of churches are making that concession about gay marriage and everything, and so they think that's the way that they're going to unite everybody together, and that's not the way because that's not biblical. Right. Right. When you tear down walls of doctrine based on the Bible, right. that's when you're going to get your change. Yeah. Yeah. And by doing that, I think that that's a step towards, you know, in the right direction. I didn't tell you all this stuff just to, you know, make you feel bad. You know, I didn't. I just want a lot of people just don't know what's going on in the world right now, and it's sad um, because we're more worried about, like I said, the things here at home in our own lives. And there's nothing wrong with having your own life. You know, that's 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 the freedom we enjoy in America. That's why I love this country so much. Is because, you know, a lot of times we're untouched by this sort of thing because we have laws, and we have you know things to to prevent that. But if this keeps going on, there's no telling where it will end. You know. We may get to a point here soon where we don't have those freedoms anymore. And that's why, too, you need to start praying for the church in general just to rise up. You know, this next, I don't want to get political. I hate getting political. But this next election is going to be huge. Um, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. That's not my job. Your job is to listen to the Holy Spirit. But really be praying about it. Because this is going to be one of those elections where if we go one way, We'll make it, but if we go the other way, we're not going to make it. Um, it's just we're, we've come so f you know far in such a short amount of time that I really believe that this is the one that's going to make the difference in whether we survive as a country on the founding principles right. of our country or not. Um, but you know, just keep that in mind. Um, you know, in this church too, you know, we have to, as a church, you know, you're called to a church for a reason. I've talked about this before as I've, you know, preached with you guys. God calls you to a certain church, and he wants you to be there, and he wants you guys to be, he wants us to be united. You know, there should be no division within us. Um, if there's any issues, they need to be worked out. They don't need to be brewing up and, you know, exploding into some, something that hurts the church even more. Um, I just, I don't know, I, I just, I really believe that the, the answer to what we're dealing with right now is just us, us coming together as a church, you know, and, and, and just locking arms in the water, I guess, you know, to, to survive and to get to our next point, because there's people here who love you, there's people here who care about you, we all love you, all care about you, and Just know that you have people cheering you on. That there are people praying for you. And then just take the time and just you know, really ask God, what, 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 who, who needs to be prayed for? You know, who do I need to pray for today? Um, you can ask people, is there anything you need me to pray for you about? It doesn't have to be, you know. I, I, sometimes some of the battles we do fight are private. You know, we, we can't just, you know, at the time tell you what's going on. But... Yeah, I mean, yeah, pray for me. <laughs> you know, that I have the strength to get through what I'm going through. And then that, that in itself is enough. And so, um, but yeah, like I said, I encourage you just to, you know, really take that to heart. Really think about um, our brothers and sisters who are over overseas right now dealing with a lot. And keep them in your prayers. Um, and that's really all I have for you tonight. <laughs> we trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, PO Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, 
please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.